two weeks before shipping out to the Pacific, and we had the feeling that's where we were heading, uh, I get orders. Much to the disgust of the commanding officer, who just, you know, I, I was his communications officer besides being radar. I mean, all the dispatches and everything went, came through me. And uh, now I'm gone. So he tried to keep me, but no, no, no luck. Uh, so I get orders. You ought to report to Commander Atlantic Fleet, Norfolk, Virginia, for further orders. A Norfolk base is just like uh, finding yourself in the middle of a huge city. It took me three days of going from one office to another until finally I was told by a chief petty officer, uh, Mr. Gagarin, you take your stuff and go downtown and catch a bus to Elizabeth City, North Carolina, 40 miles south of here. Uh, go to the Coast Guard base and report there. You'll find out when you report to the Navy detachment of the Coast Guard base what to do. So I went, took the bus, got a cab seven miles to the base, and as the cab drove in, this is where I saw a PBY with uh, red stars on it. And I said, aha. Now I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> the chief petty officer was an interesting guy, Chief uh, uh, Kravitsky. Uh, and he had a, a lot of stripes. I mean, he'd been in the Navy, and he, he came from Russia as an emigre in the 20s. And he ended up at Ellis Island. I asked him by his back, and he remembered some Russian, but not much. Uh, there was another guy, there's another guy by the name of Kostritsky. Actually, there were about three of us who spoke fairly decent Russian. And one interesting thing, at that time there was a, a seaman, a, a U.S. Navy seaman, who came straight from the Indian Reservation and somewhere in the Carolinas into the Navy. And he was looking at all this and lend lease. He says, what's all this lend lease? He says, we're giving these planes to these Russians and so on. Why don't we have lend lease on the reservation? <laughs> um, he was, I really admire that guy. He had a great common sense. He was a good mechanic, uh, but unfortunately, he never got the education. I don't know what, he, what happened to him or what he's doing, but I always remember that young Indian seaman as being so intelligent. Uh, this model doesn't show it, but it had antennas, uh, radio, radio antennas running from almost the wingtip towards the tail, uh, almost on both sides, so sort of long antennas. And um, if after about four sets of flights, we got word that these antennas were breaking. And they would come to Canada, to Gander, Newfoundland, with no radio. At that time, the airport at Gander was rather busy because that's when most of the B-17s were being flown from the States to Europe to, for against Germany. And there was a B-17 leaving the flight, the plane going across the Atlantic every minute. So they couldn't just hold all traffic around Gander while they landed a disabled Soviet plane. So, but nobody could tell me why. I mean, we looked at the antennas, we did all we could to find out the problem. Finally, I said, well, let me go up there. 
So I did fly with one of the flights uh, from Elizabeth City to Ganda. On the way, I, I took my time to really teach the radio guy all about the electronic system he's got. He, he knew m most of it, but he was very weak, especially in direction finding. I, and I kept plotting a course uh, by triangulating on stations in New York, Boston, and somewhere in Maine. I could triangulate and plot exactly where we were and how we were proceeding. And I was showing him how to do that. And we were going at an angle about three degrees off course towards uh, Gander. So I mentioned to him, said, why don't you tell the pilot, says, that we're flying slightly off course, just notch the thing over by three degrees to the west here. They answer, so I went from our captain to the lead plane captain who waited, came back and said, how do you know we're flying off course? Well, Gagarin's back here plotting the course. And he's telling me, silence. We'll stay on course, as I tell you. <laughs> Typical Soviet, no, I'm right. So eventually we fly, I, I didn't worry. I knew where I was. <laughs> I could tell him eventually, especially after training those guys on PBMs flying out of uh, Rio de Janeiro, you know. If I could find them in Rio de Janeiro, Charleston for them, I could find Gander for this guy. And uh, uh, finally we fly over, uh, there's a bunch of islands, and those are those French islands off the coast of Canada, St. Pierre and Miquelon. And then when you saw those islands, you realized where you was and <laughs> turned west <laughs> to Gander. But, but then coming back to the antenna problem, Actually, the Canadians is the guy who helped me out the most because what happened at the Naval Aircraft Factory, there was copper wire and they soldered the antenna to grommets. And um, this thing, as it flies, sets up mechanical waves. And as it flops, at the end of the wire, it goes like this all the time. And it would break right under grommet. And that's it, no antenna. Well, what happened was the aircraft factory did two things wrong. One, they soldered this thing, which damaged the physical nature of the copper wire, made it weaker by heating and cooling. And secondly, it was badly corroded by the high corrosion atmosphere of the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. So finally we told the the aircraft factory says, look, from now on, send us these planes without the antennas. Just give me one short antenna for radio contact, and that's all. And we'll put them on in, in here, or else you fellas splice them. And they did that. For the next hundred planes, we had no problems. <laughs> so it's things of this nature that came up. There were two commanding officers. Uh, the first one, unfortunately, never made it back to Russia. He was the only plane we lost en route uh, off the coast of Norway. And on that first bunch. Actually, it was him and another pilot on another plane flying more or less together. And the other pilot reported very dense fog and terrible weather and they they had radio silence they had to have radio silence because the Germans were just waiting to hear that uh, on, off the coast of Norway uh, but he did break radio silence to try to find this man and, and he just disappeared after the war uh, I know they've been searching uh, both Luftwaffe records, Norwegian records, 
and there's nothing about anybody shooting down that plane. Um, the one plane that came through has, did report that uh, they had terrible weather, storms and so on. And it may well be that they, they just uh, crashed, went in, went in lower and lower and lower in the water, they went too low and went in. So that was the only one we lost on takeoff, uh, I should say lost en route.